When it comes to guys who never won the WWF Championship but really should have, Ricky Steamboat's name has to get a mention. During a time when giant larger than life superstars dominated the ranks, here was a guy that brought something unique to the table. Ricky Steamboat was a hybrid wrestler, blending in amateur wrestling with high risk offense and martial arts, all blended together to create a graceful ring style that nobody was doing back then. Steamboat was adored by his fans, young and old, thanks to this unique offense and his likeable character. So loved was Ricky Steamboat that he is one of the very few men in wrestling who never had a heel run, he always played the good guy. Ricky Steamboat's initial WWF run was cut short due to the man's desire to spend time with his family. Steamboat didn't walk out, nor did he have creative differences or any kind of falling out. He just wanted to be with his family as they celebrated the birth of their newborn son. The WWF granted Ricky the time off, but Vince McMahon being Vince McMahon, Steamboat was taught a lesson here about where the company felt his loyalties should lie. It's a shame, but it's also something that we hear all too frequently. Don't play by the rules and you get punished, no matter how over you are. This is a topic we will cover in today's video as we take a look at Ricky Steamboat's career. There's much to cover here, so this will be a two part video. Once part two is available, I'll update the video description and I'll also add a video link so you guys can check it out. Ricky Steamboat, real name Richard Blood, was born on February 28th, 1953 in West Point, New York. His father served in the US military and when stationed in Japan, he met his future wife. When it was time for Ricky's father to transfer back to the States, he brought his new wife back with him and soon afterwards, Ricky was born. Growing up, Ricky was able to travel around the world thanks to his father's job in the army. Once settled back in the United States though, Ricky became a standout amateur wrestler during his school days, going on to become a Florida State Champion. Ricky became a fan of wrestling while watching championship wrestling from Florida, with some of his favourites being Jack Briscoe and the great Boris Milanko. He would tune in every Saturday morning to see the superstars of Florida, and when he was able to, he would also attend shows with his friends. You'd think that Ricky's amateur background would naturally lead him to pro wrestling, but Ricky had no desire to become a professional wrestler. Instead, Ricky wanted to become a fireman or a policeman. Ricky's girlfriend at the time was an air hostess. Through her job, she met Dana Gagne, the daughter of Vern Gagne. It was through this mutual friendship that Ricky decided he would attend Vern Gagne's training camp, even though he previously had no intentions of becoming a pro wrestler. He did feel that this opportunity was too good to pass up, and he may never get an opportunity like this ever again. Ricky went to Vern's training camp then and it was well known for being brutally difficult. Steamboat said that around 16 guys showed up on day one to begin training and after a few days, around a dozen had left. Ricky stuck it out though, revealing that he dropped 40 pounds by the time he had completed his training. So Ricky had completed the gruelling training regime and he was ready for work. He got his start in Vern's AWA in 1976, working as a babyface here under his real name, Rick Blood. After a few short months, Vern decided to send Ricky to the CWF, the same promotion that Ricky had watched growing up. Upon arrival, booker Eddie Graham decided to change Ricky's name, saying that Rick Blood sounded too much like a heel moniker. He wasn't wrong. Eddie decided that Ricky would be billed as the nephew of Sammy Steamboat, a successful wrestler in the Florida area from years past. Sammy Steamboat was billed from Hawaii, and his kayfabe nephew, Ricky Steamboat, would now also be billed from the same state. Ricky said they could have called him anything, he was just glad to have a job. Ricky's time in the CWF was also short, staying only a few months before making his way to Atlanta to work in Georgia Championship Wrestling, and soon afterwards he worked in Mid-Atlantic under the Jim Crockett Promotions banner. 
It was during this time that Ricky Steamboat really began standing out, getting the chance to work alongside guys like Tony Atlas, Wahoo McDaniel, Rocky Johnson, wrestling bio's favourite Larry Sharp, and of course, nature boy Ric Flair. Flair took an instant lagging to Steamboat thanks to his incredible in-ring ability and also because Ricky was a humble guy. On first meeting Steamboat, Ric Flair said, when he came to TV, I just said, man, here's a guy that's handsome with a great body, a nice guy, and Ricky Steamboat could wrestle from day one. I went up to him and said that I'd like to work with him and that I was going to suggest something to George Scott. That was the first time I met him, and he said, yeah, he'd love to. Within months of coming into Jim Crockett promotions, Ricky Steamboat was working with Ric Flair. Their feud started off hot, their contrasting portrayed lifestyles really helping to make their storied rivalry much more unique. Here you had Ricky Steamboat, a quiet man who didn't say much on the mic, he was reserved but very capable in the ring, and then you had the nature boy Ric Flair, a loudmouth who would brag about how great he is at any given opportunity. It was a match made in heaven, and the Flair vs Steamboat match would go on to generate a lot of money and sell out a ton of dates. One of the more remembered moments early in the rivalry was when Flair rubbed Steamboat's face on the concrete floor, going on to brag about it the next week showing pictures of how damaged Steamboat's face really was. Steamboat got his revenge by laying a beatdown on the nature boy in the middle of the ring, ripping up his expensive suit in the process while getting huge cheers from the studio audience. Steamboat became a star when he defeated Flair for the NWA Mid-Atlantic TV Championship in North Carolina. As the years went on, Ricky Steamboat picked up 8 NWA US Championship reigns and 6 NWA Tag Title reigns. His tag team days are worth mentioning, in particular his partnership with Jay Youngblood. Ricky had wanted to form a tag team in order to try something different, and he approached Jay Youngblood as a potential partner. This led to a real friendship between the two, with Youngblood and Steamboat becoming inseparable behind the scenes. They drove together, worked together, had each other's backs in the locker room, a real team in every sense of the word. In the ring, the pair would become hugely popular and I do feel that this team of Steamboat and Youngblood are just not talked about as much as what they should be. For a shining example of just how over these guys were, look no further than their feud with Sergeant Slaughter and Don Carnoodle. Youngblood and Steamboat were going after the tag team titles at this time and a cage match was booked to settle the score. That night in Greensboro on March 12th 1983, Slaughter, Canoodle, Steamboat and Youngblood put on an excellent match that's became somewhat of a hidden gem these days. Slaughter said in an interview that 30,000 fans were turned away from the arena, and while we can't really confirm if Slaughter's numbers are accurate here, it does let us know that the match was promoted superbly. The match was so good that the two teams were booked into further cage matches in the weeks that followed. Steamboat said that it was 30 cage matches in 30 days, but when we look at the old records here, this was maybe a slight exaggeration. Another hot feud featuring Steamboat and Youngblood was against the Briscoe brothers, Jack and Jerry. The Briscoes were initially friendly with Steamboat and Youngblood, and when they turned on them, man, they got some proper heat. Their feud led to Starcade 1983, the very first Starcade event, and in the semi-main, Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood defeated the Briscoe brothers in another excellent and exciting match. Jerry Briscoe calls this one of the best angles that Mid-Atlantic ever put on. Steamboat and Youngblood felt their time as a tag team had run its course, and they both agreed that splitting up to compete in singles would be the better option for both men. A few months later, due to a falling out with Dusty Rhodes over creative differences, Ricky Steamboat decided to leave the NWA and join the World Wrestling Federation. As for Jay Youngblood, he passed away just months after Steamboat made his WWF debut. A series of heart attacks took his life, and he was only 30 years old when he passed away. Ricky Steamboat came into the WWF using the same gimmick he had used in JCP. Within weeks though, Ricky was given the nickname The Dragon, and the martial arts shenanigans was definitely turned up a notch. 
Back then, the WWF was all about marketable characters that the company could make money from, whether it be clothing, magazines, action figures, that kind of thing. You have to remember that martial arts movies and TV shows were hot in the 80s, and the WWF were doing what they always have done here, trying to cash in on trends. We will always find the most hardcore of fans who thought this dragon stuff was awful and stereotypical, and I agree, it was stereotypical, but I didn't think for a moment that it was awful. I thought the Ricky the Dragon Steamboat character was good, it was different, it brought something new to a table that was already overloaded with larger than life muscle guys. With the focus here on Ricky being a master of martial arts, he put more emphasis on the fact during his matches. The thing was, Ricky was more than capable of doing this stuff, he stood out because of it. With the amateur background and everything he had learned from wrestling the likes of Flair, Roddy Piper, the Briscoes, Slaughter, and putting on a more unique twist on his already graceful moveset, there was no one in the WWF like the Dragon. He became an instant fan favourite, walking into the very first WrestleMania and scoring a win over Matt Bourne. Steamboat's first real WWF feud was against Mr. Fuji and Don Morocco, a feud that saw Steamboat working against Mr. Fuji in a Kung Fu challenge on the third Saturday night's main event show. At the fourth Saturday night's main event, he teamed with another huge fan favourite, the Junkyard Dog. Junkyard Dog and Ricky Steamboat defeated Morocco and Fuji in a tag team match that was actually a lot of fun. JYD and Steamboat, two great fan favourites here who really had the crowd on their side, and two men who would never win the big one in the WWF. What a shame that was. WrestleMania 2 saw Steamboat defeat Hercules during the Los Angeles portion of the event. From here, the Dragon feuded with the Snake, Mr. Jake Roberts. Their rivalry got off to a rather scary start though. At the 6th Saturday Night's Main Event show held on May 3rd 1986, Vince McMahon wanted the Steamboat vs Roberts match to start with a DDT on the outside of the ring. While Roberts was more than capable of delivering DDTs, he didn't want to perform the move on the outside of the ring here. Remember, there was no protective mats, it was concrete. Ricky Steamboat didn't have a problem taking the bump, he assured Roberts that he would protect himself. Against his wishes, Roberts performed the move as instructed. The sound of Steamboat's head smashing into the ground is sickening. Jake Roberts described the sound like a bursting watermelon. Straight away, you just knew that things weren't right here. Steamboat was out cold and Roberts had real difficulties trying to lift him back into the ring. Jake said that it took two weeks for Ricky's eyes to go black and during that time, his eyes and face were morbidly swollen. Ricky got really lucky here. Of course, this is pro wrestling and the thing to do is to turn a negative into a positive, right? The Steamboat vs Jake Roberts feud ended up being a highlight of this time period. The two had an ODQ snake pit match at the big event in Toronto in front of 74,000 fans and they ended their feud at Saturday night's main event 7. Amazing stuff. The Steamboat vs Roberts matches are worth hunting down, they are good and one of Steamboat's best feuds was indeed against Jake Roberts. He's had so many good feuds against the likes of Ric Flair, Steve Austin, Jake Roberts and of course he also had a great feud with Macho Man Randy Savage. Before getting into the Savage match at WrestleMania 3, I need to point out that I have already covered this match in a previous video. I don't want to cover old ground here, and if you want a more in-depth look at the build-up to their epic WrestleMania encounter, I suggest pausing this video and checking out the Steamboat vs Savage video. I'll include a link in the video description for you guys to check out. I'll try to be as brief as possible here, but Savage vs Steamboat arguably changed the landscape of professional wrestling in the WWF. The main event that evening was Andre the Giant vs Hulk Hogan, a notable match for sure and also a well remembered showdown that included a huge WrestleMania moment. 
Savage and Steamboat knew that this WrestleMania was going to attract a huge audience and both men were determined to steal the show. Savage was meticulous when planning his matches. He would want everything planned move for move before going out to perform. But for this match with Steamboat at Mania 3, he kicked it into a completely different gear. Steamboat and Savage sat down with notepads and numbered every single step of the match, ending up with a huge list of spots. The pair would test each other in the days leading up to Mania 3. So for example, Savage would ask Steamboat what comes after step 34 or what comes before step 5. It was planning on a whole different level, but it seriously paid off. The main event of Mania 3 featured two huge guys, two larger than life monsters, stepping into the ring for a clash of the titans, but the intercontinental title match between Savage and Steamboat would be an athletic showcase, one that had never been seen before on this kind of scale. False finishes weren't seen often in wrestling matches, and quick pin covers after takedowns weren't really seen either, but this match was jam packed with them. Add into this the in-ring abilities of both Savage and Steamboat and the insane planning that went into this match and you have a genuine trend setting classic. Many young wannabe wrestlers watched this match as children or teenagers, noticing that Steamboat and Savage weren't the biggest guys in the world but here they were putting on the most exciting match of the night and those very same young kids learned that they too could be wrestlers without needing to be lumbering giants. It's difficult to appreciate how groundbreaking this match was nowadays, as many of the spots in the match and the style itself is taken for granted, but watch WrestleMania 1 and 2 and then watch Savage vs Steamboat at Mania 3 and you'll get a good idea of how truly innovative and revolutionary this match truly was. Steamboat picked up the win here, his first singles championship in the World Wrestling Federation as the crowd roared with approval. Steamboat said, I'll never forget the Wrestlemania party afterwards. Everyone was congratulating myself and everyone was congratulating Randy Savage. They actually started a line. Then I looked over at Hogan's table and there was nobody. So now I've got a funny feeling about this. The return matches that Randy and I could have had off the Wrestlemania match, we could have wrestled over four or six months. I felt disappointed that we didn't. Weeks after winning the Intercontinental title, Ricky Steamboat approached Vince McMahon asking for time off so he could be there when his newborn son arrived. Vince granted Ricky the time off, but Ricky was not allowed to hold on to the Intercontinental title, something that upset Ricky, but in all honesty, you can't really blame Vince here for wanting to keep his title on TV, and it shows. Ricky is still a little disheartened about all of this, but he had no choice. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat dropped the IC title on the June 13th episode of Superstars. It's been reported that Steamboat was to drop the title to Butch Reed, but Butch didn't show up that night. And instead, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat dropped the title to the Hunky Tonk Man. It's funny how things work out, what with the Hunky Tonk Man holding on to the IC title for so long after this. But anyway, Ricky's son was born a month after he dropped the title here. Steamboat then came back in time for the 1987 Survivor Series, but it definitely seemed like the higher ups weren't too happy about him taking this sabbatical. He wasn't pushed, he wasn't given any meaningful feuds to sink his teeth into, nothing. Steamboat himself thinks it was due to a combination of two things, the first of course being that he took a break and left the WWF, and the second reason that Steamboat has given was the fact that he showed up Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 3. I'm not so sure about this second opinion though, it's not like Randy Savage took any heat for the Mania 3 match, but in saying that, you just never know with these kind of things. I can only say what's been reported and said in interviews here with Ricky himself. Ricky went on to defeat Rick Rude at the 1988 Royal Rumble and from here, he was entered into the WWF Championship Tournament at WrestleMania 4. If both Steamboat and Savage won their first round matches, we would have seen a rematch from WrestleMania 3. It's absolutely insane to think that the WWF wouldn't put on this rematch from Mania 3. After all the match of the year awards that this showdown got, it would have been silly not to put this match on, right? But what do you know, Steamboat was defeated by Greg Valentine in his first round match. Savage would go on to win the whole tournament, 
but I feel it would have meant a whole lot more if Savage defeated Steamboat on his way to the championship. Steamboat became disgruntled with his new position in the WWF cards and you can't really blame him either. Ricky left after WrestleMania 4 and we wouldn't see him again for the remainder of the year. Ricky got an opportunity to return to the NWA, something that he felt would be a wise career move, and he returned to the NWA affiliated World Championship Wrestling on January 21st 1989, revealing himself as Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert's tag partner in a match against NWA Champion Ric Flair and Barry Windham. Steamboat got the pinfall victory over the Nature Boy, and the Flair vs Steamboat feud was on once again. This is where we will end part 1 then. We have a lot more ground to cover, including Steamboat's NWA title win over Ric Flair, his 1991 return to the World Wrestling Federation, his later run in WCW, and his amazing return to in-ring competition at WrestleMania 25. Part 2 will be available very soon.